Chapter 1 The Birth of a Sage Over 2,500 years ago, in a small, quiet village nestled in the heart of ancient China, a child was born. The world didn't know it yet, but this child would one day become one of the greatest thinkers in history. His name? Confucius. Confucius came into the world at a time of great turmoil. China was divided into many small states, each ruled by its own lord. Wars were common, and life was hard for most people. But even in these difficult times, there was hope. And that hope came in the form of this tiny baby, born to a humble family. His family was poor, very poor. They didn't have much to give him, no fine clothes, no soft bed. But they did have love and a strong sense of right and wrong. Confucius's father was a soldier, but he was old, very old. His mother, however, was young and full of life. She was wise beyond her years, and she knew, oh, she knew, that her son was special. From the very beginning, Confucius showed signs of greatness. As a baby, he was quiet and thoughtful. His eyes seemed to see more than just what was in front of him. He watched the world around him with curiosity. And even before he could speak, it was clear. This child was different. His mother. She nurtured this curiosity. She encouraged him to ask questions, to explore, to think. She didn't have much to give him in terms of material wealth, but she gave him the most valuable gift of all, the love of learning. As Confucius grew older, his thirst for knowledge only deepened. He wanted to know everything, why the sky was blue, why the seasons changed, why people acted the way they did. He was never satisfied with simple answers. He wanted to understand the truth, the deeper meaning behind things. But learning wasn't easy for a boy like Confucius. His family couldn't afford to send him to a fancy school. They didn't have the money for books or tutors. Yet, his mother, oh, his mother, she found a way. She made sure he had access to whatever knowledge she could find. She told him stories from the past, tales of great heroes and wise men. She taught him about the importance of respect, of kindness, of doing what is right, even when it is hard. Confucius listened to his mother's lessons with rapt attention. He absorbed every word, every idea, and his mind. Oh, his mind. It was like a sponge. He didn't just learn. He understood. And more than that, he began to see the world differently. He started to see the connections between things. The way everything was linked together, like a great web. As he grew older, Confucius began to ask even more difficult questions. Why were some people rich while others were poor? Why did rulers fight wars that caused so much suffering? Why did people lie, cheat, and hurt each other? These questions, they burned inside him. He couldn't just accept the world as it was. He needed to find a way to make it better. But where could he find the answers? The world was full of wise men and scholars, but none of them seemed to have the answers he sought. They taught about the rules of society, the proper way to behave. But for Confucius, it wasn't enough. He wanted to know the why behind these rules. He wanted to understand the deeper truths that guided human life. One day, as a young boy, Confucius stood on a hilltop, looking out over the village where he was born. The wind blew gently through the trees, carrying with it the scent of earth and grass. As he stood there, 
he felt a deep connection to the land, to the people, to everything around him. And in that moment, he made a decision. He would dedicate his life to seeking wisdom, to finding the answers to the questions that troubled him, and to teaching others what he learned. His mother, she supported him every step of the way. She knew that his path would be difficult, that he would face many challenges, but she also knew that he had the strength to overcome them. You are destined for greatness, she would tell him. But remember, greatness isn't about power or wealth. It's about wisdom and how you use it to help others. Confucius took these words to heart. He knew that his journey would be long and hard, but he was ready. He was determined to learn, to grow, and to find the wisdom he sought. And so he began his journey. A journey that would take him across China, through cities and villages, to the courts of kings and the homes of the poor. As he traveled, Confucius met many people, some kind, some cruel, some wise, some foolish. But from each one, he learned something valuable. He saw the suffering caused by greed and corruption, the pain of those who were oppressed, and the emptiness of those who had everything but felt nothing. And through it all, he began to form his own ideas, his own philosophy. Confucius believed that the key to a better world was not in laws or punishments, but in people's hearts. He believed that if people could be taught to be good, to be kind, respectful, and just, then society would naturally become better. It was a simple idea, but powerful. And it was this idea that would eventually change the world. But that is a story for another time. For now, let us remember the young boy standing on that hilltop, looking out over his village, filled with dreams of wisdom and a better world. This was the beginning of Confucius's journey, the birth of a sage who would one day guide millions. The road ahead would not be easy. There would be challenges, doubts, and many difficult choices. But Confucius was ready. He had the love of his mother, the strength of his convictions, and a mind that never stopped asking, never stopped seeking. And so, with a heart full of hope and a mind full of questions, Confucius set out on the path that would lead him to greatness. Chapter 2 The Journey of Learning Confucius was a passionate learner, a seeker of wisdom. From the moment he was old enough to understand the world around him, he knew knowledge was the key. He read every book he could find, devoured every story, every lesson his teacher shared. But there was something inside him that knew. Books alone could not give him all the answers he sought. True wisdom. Oh yes, true wisdom. It came from experience, from life itself. So Confucius made a decision, a bold decision. He would travel across China, far and wide, to learn from the world itself. He would speak to everyone he could, to farmers working in the fields, to nobles living in grand palaces, to soldiers hardened by war. Each person, he believed, had a piece of the puzzle, a piece of the great truth he was searching for. His journey began in his own village, where he spoke to the elders, the men and women who had lived long lives and seen many things. He listened. Oh, how he listened. To their stories of the past to their advice on how to live a good life. Respect your elders, they told him. Honor your ancestors. These lessons, 
They made sense to him, but Confucius wanted more. He needed to know why these things were important. He needed to understand the deeper meaning behind these words. So he set out from his village with nothing but a small bag of belongings and a heart full of questions. His first stop was a neighboring town where he met a farmer named Lao. Lao was an old man, his hands rough and calloused from years of working the land. But there was a kindness in his eyes, a wisdom that came not from books, but from a life of hard work and perseverance. Confucius spent days with Lao, walking through the fields, watching him plant seeds, harvest crops. Tell me, Confucius asked, what have you learned from working the land all these years? Lao looked at him, then at the earth beneath his feet. The land is like life, he said slowly. You reap what you sow. If you plant good seeds and take care of them, they will grow strong and healthy. But if you neglect them or plant bad seeds, your harvest will be poor. Life is the same. If you do good deeds, if you work hard and live with honesty, your life will be rich. But if you lie, cheat, and do harm, your life will be barren. These words, they struck Confucius deeply, simple yet profound. They made him think about his own life, about the seeds he was planting. He realized that wisdom didn't always come from complicated ideas. Sometimes the greatest truths were the simplest. But he didn't stop there. Oh no. Confucius knew that his journey had just begun. From the fields of Lao, he moved on to the bustling city of Lu, where he met scholars and nobles, people who had studied for years and held great knowledge. He listened to their lectures on history, on politics, on philosophy. He read their books, filled with words that were both beautiful and complex. Yet, as he listened and read, Confucius began to notice something. These scholars, they were wise, yes, but their wisdom was different from Lao's. They knew the theories, the laws, the ancient texts, but many of them lacked the connection to the everyday life that Lao had. They understood the world through the lens of their education, but not always through the lens of experience. One day, Confucius was invited to a grand banquet, a feast held by one of the nobles of Lu. The room was filled with rich food, fine wine, and the chatter of well-dressed men and women. As he sat there, watching the nobles talk and laugh, he couldn't help but think of Lao, working in the fields, content with his simple life. There was a disconnect, a gap between the world of the scholars and the world of the farmers. And Confucius, he wanted to bridge that gap. As the banquet continued, Confucius asked the nobleman beside him, Tell me, what do you think is the most important quality a ruler should have? The nobleman, who was dressed in silk robes, thought for a moment before answering. A ruler must be strong, he said. He must be powerful and feared by his enemies. Only then can he maintain control and keep order in his land. Confucius nodded, but inside, he wasn't satisfied with this answer. Strength was important, yes. But was it the most important? He thought back to Lao to the farmer's simple wisdom about planting good seeds. Strength alone could not bring a good harvest. There had to be more, something deeper. His journey continued, from the grand city of Lu to the dusty roads of the countryside. He met soldiers who had fought in battles, their faces lined with the scars of war. 
He spoke to merchants who traveled from town to town, trading goods and stories. He listened to the tales of mothers raising children, of craftsmen creating beautiful works with their hands. Each person, each encounter, taught him something new. From the soldiers, Confucius learned about courage, about the strength it takes to stand up for what is right, even when it is difficult. But he also learned about the cost of war, the pain and suffering it brings, not just to the soldiers, but to everyone. War. It was not the answer to the world's problems. There had to be another way. A way to solve conflicts without violence. From the merchants, Confucius learned about the importance of fairness, of honesty in trade and in life. They told him stories of deals made and broken, of trust earned and lost. A man's word, they said, is like gold. Once you lose it, it's hard to get it back. This lesson, it resonated with Confucius. Trust, he realized, was the foundation of all human relationships. Without it, society would crumble. As Confucius traveled, he began to piece together these lessons, weaving them into a tapestry of understanding. He saw that wisdom was not just one thing. It was a collection of many things, of experiences, of stories, of lessons learned from all walks of life. It wasn't enough to know the words of the scholars. One had to understand the lives of the farmers, the soldiers, the merchants, the mothers. True wisdom, oh yes, true wisdom, came from seeing the world through many eyes, from understanding the struggles and joys of others. One day, after many months of travel, Confucius found himself back in his village. He was older now, wiser, but also more humble. He realized that the more he learned, the more he understood how much he didn't know. And this, this realization was perhaps the greatest lesson of all. He went to see Lao, the old farmer, who was still working the fields. As they walked together, Confucius shared with him the stories of his journey, the lessons he had learned from the scholars, the soldiers, the merchants. Lao listened carefully, nodding as Confucius spoke. You've learned much, Lao said with a smile. But remember, Confucius, wisdom is like a tree. It takes time to grow, and it needs strong roots. The roots are the simple truths we learn early in life, the things we often take for granted. Don't forget them as you continue to grow. Confucius nodded, understanding now what Lao meant. He had seen the world, learned from many people, and gathered much knowledge. But the foundation of wisdom, the roots, were the simple, profound truths he had learned from the very beginning. Respect, kindness, honesty, and humility. These were the seeds of wisdom. And so, Confucius returned to his studies, but with a new perspective. He knew now that learning was not just about books or lectures. It was about life itself. Every person he met, every experience he had, was a teacher. And Confucius, he would never stop being a student. This journey of learning, it was only the beginning for Confucius. There was still so much to discover so much to understand. But he was ready, ready to continue his quest for wisdom, knowing that the path ahead would be filled with both challenges and revelations. Chapter 3. The Teacher Emerges As Confucius grew older, something began to change within him, something profound. His thirst for knowledge his endless curiosity, it evolved into something even greater. 
Confucius no longer wanted to keep this wisdom just for himself. No. He felt a deep desire to share it with others. He wanted to teach. Teaching. It wasn't just a job for Confucius. It was a calling, a mission. He believed that if people could learn the right way to live, if they could understand the true meaning of respect, kindness, and duty, the world could become a better place. And so, the teacher in him began to emerge, and with it, a light that would guide many. Confucius didn't have a grand school. He didn't have fancy buildings or a large library. What he had was his knowledge, his wisdom, and his heart. And that was more than enough. He began to gather students, young men who were eager, curious, and hungry for knowledge. They came from near and far, drawn by the stories they had heard about this wise man who saw the world in a different way. And Confucius, oh, how he taught them. He didn't just stand in front of them and recite lessons from dusty old books. No. Confucius believed that teaching was more than just filling the mind with facts. It was about touching the heart, inspiring the soul, and guiding the spirit. His lessons were living, breathing things, filled with passion and purpose. One of the first things Confucius taught his students was the importance of respect. Respect, it was the foundation of everything. You must respect your parents, he would say, his voice calm but firm. You must respect your elders, your teachers, and your friends. But most of all, you must respect yourself. His students listened intently their eyes wide with wonder. They had never heard teachings like this before, teachings that felt so personal. Confucius explained that respect was not just about obedience. It was about understanding the value of others, recognizing their worth, and treating them with dignity. He would often take his students on walks through the countryside, using the world around them as his classroom. As they walked, he would point out the simple things in life. A bird building its nest, a farmer tending his crops, a mother caring for her child. See how they all show respect for life, he would say. The bird respects the tree by not harming it as it builds its nest. The farmer respects the earth by nurturing it. The mother respects her child by giving it love and care. This, this is the essence of respect. His students, they were amazed. This was not just education. It was enlightenment. Confucius was teaching them how to see the world differently, how to find meaning in the simplest of things. His words were like seeds, planting themselves in the hearts of his students growing into a deep understanding of what it meant to live a good life. But Confucius didn't stop at teaching respect. He also taught about kindness, a virtue he believed was at the core of human goodness. Do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself, he would say, a gentle smile on his face. Kindness. It is the thread that connects us all. His students learned that kindness wasn't just about being nice. It was about empathy, about putting yourself in someone else's shoes and feeling what they feel. Confucius would share stories of people who had shown great kindness, sometimes at great personal cost. He would talk about how kindness could heal wounds bring people together, and create harmony in the world. One day, as they sat under a large tree, Confucius asked his students a question. 
What is the greatest act of kindness you can do for someone? The students thought for a moment, then began to offer their answers. Helping a friend in need, said one. Sharing your food with someone who is hungry, said another. Giving money to the poor, said a third. Confucius nodded at each answer, his eyes shining with approval. But then he said something that made them all think deeply. The greatest act of kindness, he said softly, is to understand someone, to truly see them, to hear them, to know their heart. When you understand someone, you can help them in ways that truly matter. His students were silent, reflecting on his words. They realized that kindness wasn't just about actions. It was about connection, about understanding the humanity in others. And this, this was a lesson they would carry with them for the rest of their lives. Confucius also placed great importance on the concept of family. He believed that the family was the first school of life, the place where people learn the values that guide them throughout their lives. If the family is strong, he would say, then society is strong. He taught his students to honor their parents, to care for their siblings, and to treat their homes as sacred places. Your family is your foundation, he would tell them. It is where you learn love, trust, and responsibility. If you cannot be good to your family, how can you be good to the world? His students began to see their families in a new light. They realized that the relationships they had with their parents, siblings, and even their ancestors were not just important. They were essential. Confucius taught them that by nurturing these relationships, they could build a strong, moral character. But Confucius was not just a teacher of morals and virtues. He was also a teacher of wisdom, of how to live a balanced, harmonious life. He taught his students to seek knowledge, but also to seek balance, to find the middle path where extremes are avoided and harmony is achieved. One of his favorite sayings was, The superior man is modest in his speech, but exceeds in his actions. He wanted his students to be humble, to let their actions speak louder than their words. He believed that true wisdom was shown through deeds, not just through talk. Confucius also encouraged his students to think for themselves, he didn't want them to just accept his teachings blindly. He wanted them to question, to explore, to discover their own truths. I can teach you the path, he would say, but you must walk it yourself. This approach to teaching was revolutionary. In a time when students were often expected to simply memorize and repeat what they were taught, Confucius was encouraging independent thought, critical thinking. He wanted his students to become wise, not just knowledgeable. And his students, they were inspired. They felt that they were not just learning about life. They were learning how to live. As the years went by, Confucius's fame as a teacher grew. More and more students came to learn from him each one eager to be guided by his wisdom. They came from different backgrounds, different parts of the country. But they all had one thing in common. A desire to learn from the greatest teacher of their time. Confucius didn't just teach these students. He shaped them. He taught them to be good men, responsible citizens, and wise leaders. He taught them to value virtue over wealth, wisdom over power, and harmony over conflict. And in doing so, he didn't just change their lives. He changed the world. For Confucius, 
teaching was not just about passing on knowledge, it was about building a better future. He believed that by educating others, by instilling in them the values of respect, kindness, and wisdom, he could help create a society where peace and harmony reigned. Chapter 4 The Wise Words Spread Confucius's teachings did not stay in his small circle of students for long. Oh no, his wisdom, his gentle but powerful words, began to spread far beyond the humble places where he taught. Like ripples in a pond, each lesson, each piece of advice, traveled further and further, touching the hearts and minds of people all across China. It all started with a few students, young men who had come to learn from this extraordinary teacher. They were amazed by the depth of his knowledge, the clarity of his thoughts, and the kindness in his heart. Every day, they sat at his feet, listening, absorbing his teachings like thirsty plants drinking in the rain. They knew, they just knew, that what they were learning was something special, something the world needed to hear. And so, as they left Confucius to return to their homes, they carried his wisdom with them not just in their minds, but in their hearts. They shared his teachings with their families, their friends, and their communities. Confucius says, they would begin, and everyone would listen closely. His words were simple, yet so powerful. They made people think, made them feel, made them want to be better. One of the sayings that spread quickly was, it does not matter how slowly you go, as long as you do not stop. These words, they resonated deeply with the people. Life was hard in ancient China, filled with challenges and struggles. Many people felt overwhelmed, unsure if they could ever reach their goals. But Confucius's words, oh, they gave them hope. They realized that progress no matter how slow, was still progress. It was a light in the darkness, a reminder that perseverance was the key to success. As these teachings spread, more and more people began to follow Confucius's advice. Farmers in the fields would remind each other of his wisdom as they toiled under the hot sun. Remember, they would say, Confucius teaches us to work with patience, to keep going, no matter how hard it gets. And they did. They worked with renewed energy, knowing that every step forward, no matter how small, was a step in the right direction. But it wasn't just the common folk who were touched by Confucius's wisdom. Leaders, those in positions of power, they too began to hear about this remarkable teacher. Some were curious, others skeptical, but many were intrigued. They sent for Confucius, inviting him to their courts, hoping to learn the secrets of wise and just rule. When Confucius arrived at these courts, he was often met with grandeur, with wealth and luxury, but he was not dazzled by it. No. Confucius remained humble, focused on his mission to share wisdom, not to gain power. He spoke to the rulers with the same gentle authority he used with his students. He taught them that true leadership was not about strength or fear, but about virtue, about leading by example. Lead the people with virtue, he would say, and they will follow you willingly. Govern with kindness and justice, and there will be peace. These words, they were revolutionary. Many rulers were used to ruling with an iron fist, believing that fear was the best way to maintain control. But Confucius showed them a different way, a better way. He taught them 
that a ruler should be like the North Star, steady, consistent, guiding those around him without force. Some rulers were wise enough to listen, to take his advice to heart. They began to change the way they governed, focusing more on fairness, on kindness. They treated their people with respect, and in return, they earned their loyalty. Confucius's teachings began to transform not just individuals, but entire regions. The people prospered. There was less conflict, more harmony, and word of these changes spread even further. But not everyone welcomed Confucius's ideas. There were those who were threatened by his teachings, who saw them as a challenge to their power. These rulers, they didn't want to change. They wanted to keep ruling as they always had, with fear and oppression. They tried to dismiss Confucius, to silence his voice, but it was too late. His words had already taken root in the hearts of the people. They could not be easily forgotten or ignored. Confucius, however, did not let these challenges discourage him. He knew that not everyone would understand or accept his teachings right away. But he also knew that truth had a way of enduring. He continued to teach, to share his wisdom wherever he went, confident that those who were ready would hear him. One of the most important teachings that spread was about the importance of family. Confucius believed that the family was the foundation of society, that if families were strong, society would be strong. He taught that children should honor and respect their parents, that parents should love and guide their children, and that brothers and sisters should support each other. These ideas, they resonated deeply with the people. In a time when family was often the only source of stability and support, Confucius' teachings reinforced the bonds that held families together. Parents began to teach their children his wisdom, to pass it down from generation to generation. It became more than just a philosophy. It became a way of life. And as these teachings spread from family to family, village to village, they began to shape the culture itself. People started to see the value in living a life of virtue, of treating others with kindness and respect. They saw that by following Confucius's advice, their lives were not just better. They were richer, more meaningful. Confucius's influence grew, not because he sought power or fame, but because his words, his simple, powerful words, spoke to the truth within each person. They reminded people of the goodness they already had inside them of the potential they had to create a better world. Soon, Confucius was known across the land. His name became synonymous with wisdom, with virtue. Leaders and scholars alike quoted his sayings, and his teachings were written down, studied, and shared far and wide. Confucius's words were no longer just the lessons of a single teacher. They had become the guiding principles of a nation. But Confucius, he remained humble. He knew that his work was not done, that there was still much to teach, much to learn. He continued his journey, spreading his wisdom wherever he went, always seeking new ways to help others live better lives. And so, the wise words of Confucius, they spread like a gentle breeze carrying seeds across the land. They took root in the hearts of the people, growing into a great forest of wisdom that would stand the test of time. Confucius had not just taught a few students. He had planted the seeds of a new way of thinking, a new way of living. His teachings would continue to grow to spread, 
long after he was gone. They would shape the lives of millions, guiding them towards a life of virtue, of harmony, of peace. And that was the true power of Confucius's wisdom. Chapter 5 The Struggle for Acceptance But life was not always easy for Confucius, even with his great wisdom, even with his powerful words that could touch the hearts of many. There were those who did not want to listen. These were the ones in power, the rulers, the nobles, the men who controlled the cities and the armies. They were afraid, afraid of change, afraid of losing the control they had over their people. And so they resisted. Confucius knew that to truly change the world, he needed the support of these rulers. He needed them to see the value in his teachings, to understand that kindness Respect and virtue were not signs of weakness, but of true strength. And so, he began a journey. A journey that would take him from city to city, court to court, in search of a ruler who would embrace his ideas. But this journey? Oh, it was not an easy one. Confucius traveled for many miles, often on foot, through heat and cold, through rain and dust. He knocked on many doors, but so many of them were closed to him. Rulers would invite him into their courts, curious to hear what this wise man had to say. But when Confucius spoke of virtue, of leading with kindness rather than fear, many of them turned away. Some laughed at him. Others grew angry. They did not want to hear that they should be kind to their people that they should govern with justice and fairness. Power, they said, comes from strength, from making others fear you. Confucius, he was saddened by this. He could see the suffering that this way of thinking caused, the people who were oppressed, the wars that were fought, the families that were torn apart. But no matter how hard he tried, he could not convince these rulers to change. One of the most difficult experiences for Confucius came when he visited the court of a powerful and wealthy lord. This lord was known for his harsh rule, for the way he taxed his people heavily and punished them severely for even the smallest mistakes. Confucius knew that if he could reach this lord, if he could make him see the value in ruling with kindness, it could change the lives of thousands. When Confucius arrived at the Lord's court, he was met with a grand display of wealth. There were golden statues, silk tapestries, and tables overflowing with food. The Lord himself sat on a high throne, looking down at Confucius with a skeptical eye. So the Lord said, You are the famous Confucius. I have heard much about you. Let's see if you are as wise as they say. Confucius bowed respectfully, as was his custom, and began to speak. He spoke of the importance of virtue, of leading by example. He told the Lord that a ruler who was just and kind would be loved by his people, and that this love was a much stronger foundation for power than fear. He spoke of the happiness that could come from a harmonious society, where people trusted their ruler and each other. The Lord listened, but as Confucius continued, his expression grew darker. Finally, the Lord interrupted him. Enough, he said, his voice booming through the hall. You speak of kindness and virtue as if they are the most important things in the world. But tell me this, Confucius. Can kindness protect my borders from invaders? Can virtue fill my coffers with gold? Can love build walls to defend my city? Confucius, calm and composed, replied, My lord, kindness and virtue may not build walls, but they build trust. And with trust, your people will stand by you in times of danger. 
They will fight for you, not because they fear you, but because they love you. And that, my Lord, is a far stronger defense than any wall. But the Lord was not convinced. He waved his hand dismissively. I have no need for your teachings, he said. Strength is what I need, strength and power. Leave my court, Confucius, and take your foolish ideas with you. Confucius bowed again, this time with a heavy heart, and left the court. Outside, as he walked away from the grand palace, he felt a deep sense of sorrow. He had tried. He had spoken from the heart, shared his deepest beliefs, but still he had not been able to change the Lord's mind. This was a difficult time for Confucius, a time of doubt, a time when he wondered if his teachings would ever be accepted. But Confucius, he did not give up. He knew that the path to wisdom was not always easy, that there would be many obstacles along the way. He had faith, faith in his ideas, faith in the goodness of people, even if that goodness was sometimes buried deep inside them. And so, he continued his journey, continued to knock on doors, to speak to rulers, to teach wherever he could. There were times when Confucius and his small group of followers went hungry, when they had no place to sleep. The road was long, and the rejections were many. But Confucius' spirit, it remained strong. He believed will with all his heart that his teachings could make the world a better place. And that belief, it gave him the strength to keep going. One day, after many months of travel, Confucius came to a small village. The people there had heard of him. They knew he was a wise teacher, and they welcomed him warmly. The village was poor, but the people were kind. They offered him food, a place to rest, and most importantly, they offered him their open hearts. Confucius stayed in the village for several days, teaching the people about respect, kindness, and the importance of family. He spoke to them in simple words, words they could understand and relate to. He didn't talk about grand philosophies or complex ideas. He talked about life, about how to live in a way that brought harmony and peace. And the people, they listened. They took his teachings to heart, and slowly, Confucius began to see a change. The village became a place of kindness where people helped each other, where they treated each other with respect. Confucius saw that his ideas, they could take root, they could grow, even in the most unlikely places. This gave him hope. He realized that even if the great rulers and lords did not accept his teachings, the common people could. And if enough people lived by these principles, they could create a ripple effect, a change that would spread from village to village, from town to town, until it reached even the halls of the powerful. Confucius knew that his struggle for acceptance was not over. There would be many more challenges ahead, many more doors that would be closed to him. But he also knew, deep in his heart, that his teachings were worth fighting for. And so, with renewed determination, he set out once again on his journey. He would keep going, keep teaching, keep believing that one day his wisdom would change the world, and little by little, step by step, that change was already beginning. The struggle for acceptance, it was difficult, but Confucius was ready ready to face the challenges, to overcome the obstacles, and to continue spreading his message of wisdom, virtue, and peace. Chapter 6. The Role of Rituals 
Confucius believed in the power of rituals, of tradition. To him, rituals were not just empty actions. Oh no, they were much more than that. They were a way to connect with the past, to honor those who came before us, and to bring order to the present. Confucius often said, Rituals keep the world in order, and he truly believed it. For Confucius, rituals were like the threads that held the fabric of society together. Without them, everything could unravel. But what exactly are rituals? And why did Confucius place so much importance on them? To answer that, we must first understand how Confucius viewed the world. He saw life as a series of relationships, between people, between families, between communities. And in these relationships, there was always the potential for conflict, for misunderstanding, for disrespect. But Confucius believed that rituals, when practiced with sincerity and respect, could help prevent these conflicts. They could bring harmony where there might otherwise be chaos. Rituals, according to Confucius, were not just about grand ceremonies or religious practices. They were also about the small, everyday actions that showed respect and consideration for others. For example, greeting someone with a bow, serving tea to a guest, showing respect to your parents, these were all rituals in Confucius's eyes. They were ways of showing that you valued the other person, that you honored the relationship you had with them. Confucius taught that when people practiced these rituals, they learned discipline. They learned to control their emotions, to think before they acted, to consider the impact of their actions on others. This discipline was not about restricting oneself, but about cultivating a sense of respect, a sense of duty towards others. It was about creating a world where people could live together in peace, where everyone knew their place and their responsibilities. One of the most important rituals that Confucius emphasized was the ritual of ancestor worship. This was a practice that had been part of Chinese culture for many generations, but Confucius gave it new meaning. He taught that by honoring their ancestors, people could stay connected to the wisdom of the past. Ancestors, he said, were not just dead relatives. They were the foundation of the family, the ones who had built the lives that their descendants were now living. By remembering and honoring them, people could show gratitude for all that they had inherited, and they could also learn from the virtues of their ancestors. Confucius would often say, To forget one's ancestors is to be like a tree without roots. He believed that by performing rituals of ancestor worship, people could keep those roots strong. This connection to the past was not about living in the past, but about using the wisdom and values of those who came before to guide one's actions in the present. But rituals were not just about the past. They were also about the present and the future. Confucius believed that when people followed rituals, they were helping to create a stable, orderly society. This was especially important in a time when China was often divided by wars and conflicts. Confucius saw that when people respected rituals, they respected each other, and this respect could help to prevent conflicts. In the family, for example, Confucius taught that there were rituals for how children should treat their parents, and how parents should treat their children. These rituals were not just rules. They were expressions of love and respect. When children bowed to their parents, it was not just a sign of obedience. It was a way of showing that they valued the guidance and care their parents had given them. 
and when parents followed rituals in raising their children, they were not just enforcing discipline. They were showing their children that they were loved and cherished. Confucius also believed that rituals played a crucial role in the governance of a country. He taught that rulers should lead by example, that they should follow rituals to show their respect for their people and for the laws of the land. A ruler who performed rituals sincerely would earn the respect of his subjects. And this respect would help to create a peaceful and prosperous society. One of the rituals that Confucius particularly valued was the ritual of offering sacrifices to heaven. This was a ceremony in which the ruler would offer thanks to the heavens for the blessings they had bestowed upon the land. Confucius saw this ritual as a way for the ruler to acknowledge that his power came not just from himself, but from a higher authority. It was a way for the ruler to show humility, to recognize that he had a duty to govern wisely and justly. But Confucius also taught that rituals must be performed with sincerity. He warned against performing rituals just for show or just because it was expected. Rituals without sincerity, he said, are like a body without a soul. For Confucius, the true value of a ritual came from the intention behind it, from the respect and thoughtfulness that went into it. If a person performed a ritual just to fulfill an obligation, without understanding or believing in its meaning, then the ritual was empty. It had no power to bring about harmony or respect. This idea of sincerity was central to Confucius's teachings on rituals. He believed that when people performed rituals with sincerity, they were not just going through the motions. They were actively participating in the creation of a harmonious society. They were showing respect not just for the ritual itself, but for the values that it represented, for the relationships that it honored. Confucius's teachings on rituals became a cornerstone of his philosophy. They were woven into every aspect of his teachings, from his ideas on family and government to his beliefs about morality and virtue. He saw rituals as a way to bring order to the world, to create a society where people could live together in peace and respect. And so, Confucius taught his students, and through them, the world, the importance of rituals. He showed them that rituals were not just about following rules, but about creating connections, about showing respect, about living a life of virtue. He taught them that through rituals, people could learn discipline, could learn to control their emotions, to think about others, to act with integrity. Confucius believed that if everyone followed these rituals, the world would be a better place. And in many ways, he was right. His teachings on rituals became deeply embedded in Chinese culture. They influenced the way people lived, the way they treated each other, the way they governed themselves. Even today, thousands of years later, the rituals that Confucius taught are still practiced, still valued, still seen as a way to create harmony in the world. The role of rituals, it was central to Confucius's vision of a better world. And through his teachings, that vision has endured, a testament to the power of rituals to connect us to the past, to guide us in the present, and to shape our future. Chapter 7. The Importance of Family For Confucius, family was everything. To him, the family was not just a group of people living together. It was the foundation upon which all of society was built. 
a strong family, he believed, was the key to a strong and harmonious society. Respect your parents, Confucius would often say. Honor your elders. These words were not just advice. They were the heart of his teachings. Confucius saw the family as the first school of life, the place where the seeds of good behavior were planted, where the lessons of respect, kindness, and duty were first learned. He taught that the way we treat our family is the way we will treat others in the world. If we are kind and respectful at home, if we honor our parents and care for our siblings, we will carry those same values with us into our communities, our workplaces, and beyond. But why was family so important to Confucius? To understand this, we need to look at how he viewed the relationships within a family. For Confucius, the family was a microcosm of society, a smaller version of the larger world. The roles and responsibilities within the family, the love between parents and children, the respect between siblings, the care for the elderly, were all reflections of how people should behave in society. Confucius believed that if a person learned to be a good son or daughter, a good brother or sister, they would also learn to be a good citizen, a good leader, a good friend. The virtues that were practiced within the family, humility, patience, compassion, were the same virtues that could bring harmony to the entire world. One of the most important lessons Confucius taught was filial piety. This is a term that might seem unfamiliar, but it was central to Confucius's philosophy. Filial piety means respect and devotion to one's parents and ancestors. It is about more than just obedience. It is about honoring the sacrifices that parents make for their children, about showing gratitude for the life they have given. Confucius believed that filial piety was the root of all virtue. A person who is filial and fraternal, he said, but who likes to oppose his superiors, is rare indeed. He taught that by respecting and caring for one's parents, a person learned to respect and care for all people. It was through the practice of filial piety that one developed a sense of duty, a sense of responsibility to others. Confucius often spoke of how important it was to care for one's parents, especially as they grew older. In his time, there were no nursing homes or retirement communities. Families were expected to care for their elderly relatives. Confucius saw this as not just a duty, but a privilege. He believed that by caring for one's parents, a person could express their love and gratitude in a deep and meaningful way. But filial piety was not just about caring for one's parents while they were alive. It also extended to honoring them after they had passed away. Confucius taught that by performing rituals of ancestor worship, by remembering and honoring the dead, people could keep the spirit of their parents and ancestors alive. This connection to the past this respect for those who came before was seen as essential to maintaining a strong and stable family. Confucius also believed that the relationship between siblings was crucial to the health of the family. He taught that brothers and sisters should love and support each other, that they should avoid jealousy and competition. In a family, everyone had a role to play. And by working together, by helping each other, the family could be strong and united. This idea of harmony within the family was something Confucius emphasized again and again. He believed that if a family was united, if there was love and respect between its members, 
then that family could face any challenge. And just as a united family could overcome difficulties, a united society, one in which people treated each other like family, could achieve peace and prosperity. Confucius's teachings on the importance of family were not just abstract ideas. They were based on his own experiences. He grew up in a family that, although not wealthy, was rich in love and respect. His mother taught him the values of hard work, of respect for elders, of the importance of education. These lessons stayed with Confucius throughout his life, shaping his philosophy and guiding his actions. As Confucius traveled and taught, he saw how families could be torn apart by greed, by jealousy, by a lack of respect. He saw how children who did not honor their parents often grew up to be selfish and unhappy. And he saw how families that practiced filial piety, that cared for each other and worked together, were strong and resilient able to face the challenges of life with grace and dignity. Confucius believed that the strength of a society could be measured by the strength of its families. If families were strong, if they were built on a foundation of love, respect, and duty, then society would be strong as well. But if families were weak, if they were divided, if they lacked respect and unity, then society would suffer. This belief in the importance of family has had a profound impact on Chinese culture and on many other cultures around the world. Even today, thousands of years after Confucius lived, his teachings on family continue to influence the way people think about their relationships with their parents, their siblings, their children. In many ways, Confucius's teachings on family are just as relevant today as they were in ancient China. We live in a world that is often fast-paced and chaotic, where the bonds of family can sometimes be stretched thin. But Confucius reminds us that no matter how busy we are, no matter how far we may roam, our family is our foundation. It is where we learn to love, to respect, to care for others. And just as Confucius taught, the way we treat our family is a reflection of how we will treat the world. If we can be kind, patient, and respectful at home, if we can honor our parents, love our siblings, care for our children, then we will carry those same values with us into our communities, our workplaces, our interactions with others. For Confucius, family was everything. It was the school of love and virtue, the place where the seeds of good behavior were planted. And this idea, this belief in the importance of family, has influenced cultures for centuries. It is a legacy that continues to shape the way we live, the way we think, the way we treat each other. Chapter 8 the Power of Education Confucius was a firm believer in education for everyone. He understood deeply that education was not just for the wealthy or the privileged. No, it was for anyone who was willing to learn, anyone who had the desire to grow and improve. Education knows no class, he declared with conviction. To Confucius, this was not just a statement. It was a guiding principle, a truth that he lived by every single day. In ancient China, education was often reserved for the rich, for those who could afford tutors and books. But Confucius, he saw things differently. He believed that every person, whether they were born into wealth or poverty, had the potential to learn, to gain wisdom, and to make a difference in the world. By nature, men are alike, he would say, but through practice, they become different. These words carried profound meaning. They were a message of hope, a promise that education could change lives. 
Confucius opened his heart and his home to anyone who wanted to learn. It didn't matter if they were rich or poor, young or old. He welcomed them all because he believed that the desire to learn was the greatest qualification of all. His students came from all walks of life, farmers, merchants, sons of noblemen, and even those who had once been considered outcasts. They all gathered around him, eager to hear his teachings, eager to grow. For Confucius, education was more than just the acquisition of knowledge. It was about building character, about becoming a better person. He taught his students that learning was a lifelong journey, one that required dedication, humility, and a willingness to change. The more you learn, he would say, the more you realize how much you do not know. This idea was both humbling and inspiring. It motivated his students to keep learning, to keep striving for wisdom. But Confucius didn't just teach his students from books. He taught them through experience, through discussions, through questioning. He believed that true understanding came from thinking deeply about what one learned, from applying it to life. He would often ask his students difficult questions, questions that made them think, that challenged their assumptions. What is the right way to live? he would ask. How can we be virtuous in a world full of challenges? These questions, they were not easy to answer, but they were the heart of Confucius's teaching. He also taught that education was not just about personal growth. It was about social responsibility. Confucius believed that those who were educated had a duty to use their knowledge to help others, to contribute to society. To educate yourself is to better the world, he would tell his students. This idea, it was revolutionary. In a time when education was often seen as a way to gain power or prestige, Confucius emphasized its role in serving others, in creating a better world. Confucius's belief in the power of education was not just about words. It was about action. He worked tirelessly to ensure that his students received the best education possible. He would spend hours with them, discussing philosophy, ethics, and the nature of life. He encouraged them to read widely, to explore different ideas, and to never stop asking questions. He who asks a question is a fool for five minutes, he would say. But he who does not ask remains a fool forever. One of Confucius's most famous teachings was that a person's education should not be limited to just one area of knowledge. He believed in a well-rounded education, one that included learning about literature, history, music, and even physical exercise. He taught his students the importance of being balanced, of developing their minds, their hearts, and their bodies. A true gentleman, he would say, is well-rounded in all things. But Confucius also recognized that education was not just about learning facts. It was about learning how to live. He taught his students the importance of virtues like honesty, kindness, and respect. He believed that education should make a person not only more knowledgeable, but also more virtuous. To know what is right and not do it, he would say, is the want of courage. For Confucius, education was about cultivating both the mind and the soul. Confucius's approach to education was truly ahead of its time. He believed in teaching by example, in being a living model of the principles he taught. His students admired him not just for his knowledge, 
but for the way he lived his life, with integrity, humility, and a deep sense of purpose. They saw in him the kind of person they aspired to be, someone who used education to better themselves and the world around them. The impact of Confucius's teachings on education was profound. His ideas spread far and wide, influencing not only his students, but also future generations. His belief in the power of education to lift people up, to transform societies, became a cornerstone of Chinese culture. And it didn't stop there. His teachings have influenced educational philosophies around the world for centuries. Confucius showed the world that education was not just a privilege for the few, but a right for everyone. He demonstrated that through education, people could rise above their circumstances, could overcome the barriers of class and status. He believed that education was the great equalizer, that it could create a society where people were judged not by their birth, but by their character and their abilities. This idea, this belief in the power of education, was a light in the darkness, a beacon of hope for all who wished to learn. It inspired people to seek knowledge, to strive for wisdom, to become the best versions of themselves. And even today, thousands of years later, Confucius's teachings continue to inspire, to guide, and to uplift. As we reflect on Confucius's teachings, let us remember the power of education, the power to change lives, to change the world. Let us remember that education is not just about gaining knowledge. It is about becoming a better person, about using what we learn to make a difference. And let us be inspired by Confucius's belief that education knows no class, that it is a gift for everyone, a light that shines for all who seek it. The power of education. It is a force for good, a force for change. And Confucius, he understood this better than anyone. Through his teachings, he showed the world that education is not just a path to knowledge, but a path to wisdom, to virtue, to a better life. And that is the true power of education. Chapter 9. The Virtue of Humility Despite his growing fame, despite the many students who flocked to him, seeking his wisdom, Confucius remained humble, always. He was known far and wide as a great teacher, a man of immense knowledge and virtue. But Confucius, he never saw himself as the greatest. No. He saw himself as something much simpler. A lifelong student, always learning, always growing. Real knowledge, Confucius would often say, is to know the extent of one's ignorance. These words carried deep meaning. They reflected a truth that guided Confucius throughout his life. He understood that no matter how much he learned, no matter how many books he read, how many lessons he taught, there was always more to discover, more to understand. This awareness, this recognition of the vastness of knowledge and the limits of his own understanding was at the heart of Confucius's humility. Confucius taught his students to value humility, to see it not as a weakness, but as a strength. He believed that humility was the foundation of true wisdom. Because only when a person admits that they do not know everything, can they open themselves up to new learning? A wise man, Confucius would say, is not afraid to say, I do not know. These words were not just advice. They were a way of life for Confucius. In his teachings, Confucius often used examples from his own life to illustrate the importance of humility. He would tell his students about the times when he had been wrong, 
when he had made mistakes and how he had learned from those experiences. He showed them that even the wisest person can be wrong, that the true measure of wisdom is not in never making mistakes, but in learning from them, in growing from them. Confucius believed that pride, the opposite of humility, was a dangerous thing. Pride could close a person's mind, make them believe that they knew everything, that they had nothing more to learn. And once a person stopped learning, they stopped growing. They became stagnant, stuck in their own limited understanding. Pride, Confucius would say, is the enemy of wisdom. He taught his students to guard against it, to always remain humble, no matter how much they knew, no matter how much they achieved. But humility, for Confucius, was not just about recognizing one's own limitations. It was also about respecting others. He taught his students that a humble person listens to others, values their opinions, even if they are different from their own. A wise man, Confucius would say, is willing to learn from anyone, no matter who they are. This was a revolutionary idea in a time when social status often determined whose voice was heard and whose was ignored. Confucius believed that everyone had something to teach, something to share. He would often say, When I walk with two others, I can always find a teacher among them. These words showed his deep respect for others. His belief that wisdom could be found in many places, from many people. He encouraged his students to listen, to be open to learning from everyone they met, no matter their background, no matter their status. This humility, this constant pursuit of learning, is what made Confucius truly wise. He never stopped questioning, never stopped seeking new knowledge, new understanding. Even as he grew older, even as his fame spread, Confucius remained a student, a student of life, always eager to learn more. One day, one of Confucius's students asked him, Master, you are so wise. Do you ever feel that you have learned everything there is to know? Confucius smiled at the question, a gentle smile filled with wisdom and kindness. No, he replied. I have not even begun to scratch the surface of all there is to know. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I do not know. This is the great beauty of learning. It never ends. These words left a deep impression on his students. They began to understand that wisdom was not a destination, but a journey. A journey that required humility. A willingness to admit that there was always more to learn, always more to discover. Confucius taught them that the wisest person was not the one who knew the most, but the one who was most open to learning. But Confucius's humility was not just about knowledge. It was also about how he lived his life. Despite his fame, despite the respect he commanded, Confucius lived simply. He did not seek wealth or power. He did not surround himself with luxury or grandeur. He lived modestly, focusing on what was truly important to him, his teaching, his students, and his quest for wisdom. Confucius's humility also extended to his relationships with others. He treated everyone with respect, whether they were rich or poor, powerful or weak. He listened to others, valued their opinions, and never placed himself above them. Even when he was in the presence of great rulers or wealthy nobles, Confucius remained humble, always remembering that true greatness was not about wealth or power, but about virtue and wisdom. This humility, this quiet strength, was what drew so many people to Confucius. They saw in him a man who, 
despite his great knowledge, remained down to earth, approachable, and kind. They admired him not just for what he knew, but for who he was. A man who lived his teachings, who embodied the virtues he spoke of. Confucius's humility also taught his students an important lesson about leadership. He showed them that a true leader was not someone who ruled with arrogance or pride, but someone who led with humility and compassion. A leader, Confucius believed, was someone who served others, who put the needs of their people before their own. A leader, he would say, must first learn to serve. This idea, this belief in humble leadership, has had a lasting impact, shaping the way leaders are viewed and respected in many cultures around the world. As we reflect on Confucius's teachings, let us remember the virtue of humility, the strength that comes from recognizing our own limitations, from being open to learning, from respecting others. Let us remember that true wisdom is not about knowing everything, but about always being willing to learn more. And let us be inspired by Confucius's example, by his lifelong pursuit of knowledge, his unwavering humility, his belief that there is always more to discover. For in this humility, in this constant quest for wisdom, lies the true greatness of Confucius. And it is this greatness, this quiet, humble strength, that has made his teachings resonate through the ages, touching the hearts and minds of people around the world. Chapter 10 The Legacy Begins As Confucius grew older, he began to reflect on his life, his teachings, the journey he had taken. He had traveled far and wide, shared his wisdom with countless students, and seen the impact of his ideas on the lives of many. But as he watched the sun set on his life, he began to realize something profound, something that filled him with both humility and a quiet sense of purpose. His ideas, his teachings, would live on, long after he was gone. Confucius was no longer just a teacher. He was a guide for generations to come. His students, they were more than just learners. They were the carriers of his wisdom, the ones who would ensure that his words would echo through history. And this realization, this understanding of the legacy he was leaving behind, gave Confucius a deep sense of peace. One day, as he sat with his students in the quiet of the evening, Confucius spoke to them about the importance of preserving knowledge, of passing it on to future generations. My dear students, he said, his voice calm and steady, the wisdom we have gained together, the lessons we have learned, they are not just for us. They are for those who will come after us, for the children of our children. It is our duty, our responsibility, to ensure that this wisdom is not lost. His students listened with great respect, understanding the gravity of his words. They had always known that their master was a man of great wisdom, but now they began to see him as something more, as a bridge between the past and the future. They knew that the knowledge they had gained from him was precious, that it was something that needed to be protected, cherished, and shared. And so, they began to write down his sayings, his ideas, his teachings. They captured his words in ink, carefully preserving the lessons they had learned over the years. They wrote about his beliefs, his thoughts on virtue, respect, humility, and the importance of family. They recorded his ideas about governance, about education, and about the power of rituals. These writings, 
these precious documents, would become the foundation of Confucianism, a philosophy that would shape the hearts and minds of millions. Confucius knew that his students were capable, that they understood the importance of their task, but he also knew that preserving his teachings was not just about writing them down. It was about living them, about embodying the principles he had taught them. A book, Confucius would say, can hold words, but only a life well-lived can hold wisdom. He wanted his students to carry his teachings in their hearts, to live by them every day, and to pass them on not just through words, but through actions. As the years went by, Confucius watched with pride as his students grew into wise and virtuous men. They became teachers themselves, spreading his teachings to new generations of students who would, in turn, continue the cycle. Confucius's ideas were like seeds, seeds that his students planted in the fertile soil of young minds, where they would grow and flourish, bearing fruit for generations to come. Confucius often spoke of the importance of tradition, of the need to honor the past while embracing the future. He believed that his teachings were not just for his time, but for all time, that the principles of respect, virtue, and humility were universal, timeless truths that could guide humanity through any era. And so, as his students carried his teachings forward, they did so with a sense of reverence, a deep understanding that they were not just preserving the past, but also shaping the future. But Confucius was not only concerned with the intellectual legacy he was leaving behind. He also thought deeply about the moral and spiritual impact of his teachings. He knew that wisdom was not just about knowledge. It was about living a good life, about making the world a better place. He believed that his teachings had the power to bring about change, to create a society where people treated each other with kindness, where leaders ruled with justice, and where families were strong and united. As he grew older, Confucius became more and more aware of the influence his teachings were having. He saw how his ideas were spreading how they were being adopted by rulers, scholars, and ordinary people alike. He saw how his students were becoming leaders in their own right, how they were using his teachings to guide their decisions, to shape their communities, to bring about positive change. And yet, despite this growing influence, Confucius remained humble. Always. He never sought power or fame. He never claimed credit for the changes that were taking place. He saw himself not as the source of wisdom, but as a vessel, a channel through which the timeless truths of humanity could flow. I am but a man, he would often say, a man who has been blessed to learn and to share what I have learned with others. Confucius's humility, his deep sense of purpose, and his unwavering commitment to his teachings these were the qualities that endeared him to his students and to the many who came after him. They saw in him not just a teacher, but a model of what it meant to live a good life, to live with integrity, with respect, with a constant thirst for wisdom. As Confucius neared the end of his life, he took comfort in knowing that his legacy was secure that his teachings would live on through his students and through the countless others who would come to learn from him, even long after he was gone. He knew that his words would continue to guide people, to inspire them to seek knowledge, to live virtuously, to treat others with kindness and respect. And so, as the sun set on Confucius's life, his legacy began to take shape not as a monument of stone or marble, 
but as a living, breathing tradition, a tradition that would grow and evolve, that would touch the lives of millions, that would echo through history. Confucius's legacy was not just about the words he spoke. It was about the lives he touched, the hearts he inspired, the changes he helped to bring about in the world. His teachings were a gift, a gift that he gave freely, with no expectation of reward, with no desire for fame. And this, this selfless dedication to the pursuit of wisdom and the betterment of humanity, is what made Confucius truly great. As we reflect on Confucius's life and teachings, let us remember the legacy he left behind, a legacy of wisdom, of virtue, of humility. Let us remember that his words are not just echoes of the past, but guides for the future, that they have the power to shape our lives, to help us become better, wiser, more compassionate people. And so, Confucius' legacy begins. A legacy that continues to this day, inspiring countless generations, guiding them on the path of wisdom, and reminding us all that the true measure of a life well-lived is not in the wealth we accumulate or the power we wield, but in the knowledge we share, the love we give, and the positive change we bring to the world. Chapter 11. The Influence Across the Ages Confucius did not know how far his teachings would reach. When he shared his wisdom with his students, when he walked through villages and spoke in the courts of rulers, he could not have imagined the impact his words would have, not just in his time, but for centuries to come. But over the years, over the centuries, his influence spread far beyond China, touching the hearts and minds of people all around the world. It all began in the small villages of ancient China, where Confucius lived and taught. His ideas on respect, on family, on education, they resonated deeply with those who heard them. People saw the truth in his words, felt the power of his wisdom, and began to adopt his teachings in their daily lives. Slowly, Confucius's ideas started to take root, not just in individual hearts, but in the fabric of society itself. As the years passed, Confucius's teachings became more than just lessons. They became a way of life. His students and their students carried his wisdom with them, spreading it to new places, sharing it with new people. Confucianism, as it came to be known, became a guiding philosophy, a set of principles that helped people navigate the challenges of life, that showed them how to live with integrity, with respect, with compassion. Confucius's ideas about respect for elders, about the importance of family, these were concepts that resonated deeply in Chinese culture. But they didn't stay there. Oh no. They spread far beyond the borders of China, influencing cultures across Asia and eventually the entire world. In Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and beyond, Confucius's teachings became a foundation for education, for government, for social behavior. Kings and emperors looked to his wisdom as they ruled their lands, seeking to govern with the same principles of virtue and justice that Confucius had taught. Scholars studied his works, finding in them a depth of understanding that could guide them in their pursuit of knowledge and truth. And ordinary people, farmers, merchants, artisans, they too found wisdom in his words, wisdom that helped them live better, more fulfilling lives. One of the most powerful ideas that spread from Confucius's teachings was the concept of ren, often translated as humaneness or benevolence. This idea that we should treat others with kindness, that we should act with compassion 
and empathy. It became a cornerstone of Confucian thought. Ren was not just a moral guideline. It was a way of living, a way of interacting with the world that could bring about harmony and peace. Another key concept was Li, which refers to ritual, propriety, and social harmony. Confucius taught that by following the proper rituals, by respecting social norms, people could create order in society and live together in harmony. This idea that there is a proper way to act, a proper way to treat others, it became deeply embedded in many cultures, shaping the way people interacted with each other, the way they built their communities. But perhaps one of the most revolutionary ideas that Confucius spread was his belief in the power of education for everyone. Education knows no class, he declared, and this idea, it was groundbreaking. Confucius believed that anyone, no matter how poor or rich, could learn and improve themselves. This belief, that education could lift people up, could give them the tools they needed to become better, wiser, and more virtuous. It was a light in the darkness, a beacon of hope for all who wished to learn. Over the centuries, Confucius's teachings on education became the foundation for educational systems across Asia. Schools were established based on his principles, where students learned not just about literature and history, but also about ethics, about how to live a good life. The civil service exams in China, which were used to select government officials, were based on Confucian teachings. These exams emphasized knowledge, virtue, and the ability to think critically. Principles that Confucius had championed, and Confucius's influence didn't stop there. As his teaching spread, they began to influence thinkers and leaders in other parts of the world. In the West, philosophers and scholars studied his works, finding in them ideas that resonated with their own beliefs about morality, governance, and education. Confucius's emphasis on virtue, on leading by example, on the importance of family and social harmony. These were ideas that found a place in many different cultures, shaping the way people thought about life, about society, about the world. Confucius's teachings also had a profound impact on art and literature. His ideas about respect, humility, and the importance of tradition influenced poets, writers, and artists who drew on his wisdom to create works that reflected the values he had taught. In paintings, in poems, in stories, the influence of Confucius could be seen, a testament to the enduring power of his ideas. But Confucius's influence was not just felt in the realms of philosophy, government, and art. His teachings also had a deep impact on the way people lived their daily lives. In many cultures, the principles of Confucianism became part of the social fabric, guiding the way people treated each other, the way they raised their children, the way they interacted with their communities. Confucius's ideas about the importance of family, about respecting one's elders, about living a life of virtue, these were lessons that were passed down from generation to generation becoming part of the cultural heritage of many societies. And so, Confucius's legacy grew across time, across cultures, across the world. His teachings, which began in the small villages of ancient China, spread far and wide, touching the lives of millions, guiding them on the path of wisdom, of virtue, of a better life. Confucius may not have known how far his teachings would reach, how deeply they would resonate with people from all walks of life. But the influence of his ideas, it is undeniable. 
Confucianism became more than just a set of teachings. It became a compass, pointing the way to a better life, to a more just and harmonious society. As we reflect on the impact of Confucius's teachings, let us remember that his wisdom is not just for the past, it is for the present and for the future. His ideas about respect, about education, about the importance of family and social harmony. These are principles that can guide us today, just as they guided people centuries ago. Confucius's influence across the ages is a testament to the power of wisdom, to the enduring value of ideas that speak to the heart of what it means to be human. His teachings remind us that no matter where we come from, no matter what challenges we face, we can always strive to live with virtue, with respect, with compassion. And so, the legacy of Confucius lives on in the hearts and minds of people around the world, in the cultures that have been shaped by his teachings, in the wisdom that continues to guide us on the path to a better life. His words, his ideas, they are not just echoes of the past. They are a light for the future, showing us the way forward, inspiring us to be better, to do better, to live better. Confucius, the teacher, the sage, the guide, his influence reaches across the ages, touching lives, shaping minds, and guiding humanity on the path of wisdom and virtue. His legacy, it is a gift to the world, a gift that continues to give, generation after generation, across time, across cultures, across the world. 2. The Eternal Sage Confucius passed away, but his spirit, his wisdom, lives on. Even though his physical presence is long gone, the light of his teachings continues to shine brightly, illuminating the paths of countless lives, guiding them toward wisdom, virtue, and a better understanding of the world. Confucius's death was not the end. Oh no. It was the beginning of something much greater, the birth of a legacy that would endure through the ages. His students, those who had gathered around him, who had learned from him, who had been inspired by his words, they carried his teachings forward, spreading them far and wide. And as the years turned into decades and the decades into centuries, Confucius's ideas took root in the hearts of people around the world. Today, even after more than 2,000 years, Confucius's teachings are still studied, still respected, still followed. In classrooms across Asia, students learn his sayings, ponder his wisdom, and reflect on how his ideas can be applied to their own lives. In homes, families teach their children the values of respect, kindness, and filial piety that Confucius so cherished. And in the hearts of people around the world, his words continue to inspire, to guide, to challenge them to be better to do better, to live better. One of Confucius's most powerful teachings was this, to see what is right and not do it is want of courage. These words, they remind us that wisdom is not just about knowing what is right, but about doing it. It's easy to recognize the right path, to understand the difference between right and wrong. But it takes true courage, true strength, to follow that path, especially when it is difficult, when it requires sacrifice, when it goes against the grain. Confucius taught that wisdom must be put into action, that knowing what is right is not enough if we do not have the courage to act on it. This teaching, it has resonated through the ages, 
reminding each generation that the pursuit of virtue, the pursuit of a good life, requires more than just knowledge. It requires bravery, determination, and a commitment to doing what is right, even when it is hard. Confucius, the eternal sage, will forever be remembered as a beacon of wisdom, a teacher for all of humanity. His life, his teachings, his impact, they have transcended time, transcended culture, transcended borders. He has become more than just a figure of history. He has become a symbol of the pursuit of wisdom, a reminder that the values of respect, kindness, and virtue are timeless, that they are as relevant today as they were thousands of years ago. In many ways, Confucius's teachings are more than just lessons. They are a way of life. They are a compass, pointing us in the right direction, helping us navigate the challenges of life with integrity, with compassion, with respect for others. His ideas about the importance of family, the value of education, the necessity of humility, these are principles that can guide us in our relationships, in our work, in our communities. But Confucius was also keenly aware of the challenges that come with living a virtuous life. He knew that the path of wisdom is not always easy, that there will be obstacles, temptations, and moments of doubt. Yet, he taught that these challenges are not to be feared, but to be embraced as opportunities to grow, to learn, to become stronger. Confucius often spoke of the importance of self-reflection, of looking inward to understand our own strengths and weaknesses. The superior man examines himself, he would say. This teaching, it encourages us to be honest with ourselves, to recognize our flaws, and to work continuously to improve. It is a reminder that the journey of wisdom is not about reaching a final destination, but about the constant pursuit of bettering ourselves. Day by day, moment by moment. In this way, Confucius' wisdom is not static. It is dynamic, alive, constantly evolving as we apply it to our own lives. His teachings are not just relics of the past. They are tools for the present, guiding us as we navigate the complexities of the modern world. Whether we are facing personal challenges, making decisions about our careers, or trying to find our place in society, Confucius's words offer guidance, clarity, and a sense of purpose. And so, as we continue to learn from Confucius, as we continue to study his teachings, to reflect on his wisdom, to strive to live by the principles he taught, we are part of a living tradition, a tradition that connects us to the past, that informs our present, and that will guide future generations. Confucius, the eternal sage, is not just a figure of history. He is a living presence in the hearts of those who seek wisdom, who value virtue, who strive to live a life of integrity and respect. His teachings are a reminder that wisdom is not confined to any one time or place, that it is universal, timeless, and always relevant. As we carry his teachings forward, as we pass them on to our children, as we apply them in our daily lives, we are contributing to the legacy of Confucius, ensuring that his wisdom continues to shine brightly, that it continues to guide humanity on the path of virtue and wisdom. In the quiet moments of reflection, in the challenges we face, in the decisions we make, Confucius's words echo through time, reminding us of the power of wisdom the importance of courage, and the value of living a life guided by virtue. And so, Confucius lives on, not just in the pages of history books,
but in the hearts and minds of people around the world. He remains a guiding light, a source of inspiration, a teacher whose lessons will never fade, whose wisdom will never grow old. Confucius, the eternal sage, is with us still, guiding us, teaching us, helping us find our way in a world that is often uncertain, often challenging. His words, his teachings, his legacy. They are gifts that continue to give, generation after generation. Let us remember Confucius, not just as a man of the past, but as a teacher for all time, a beacon of wisdom, a guide on the journey of life. His spirit, his wisdom, they live on in each of us as we strive to live by the principles he taught, as we strive to do what is right, to live with integrity, to seek wisdom and virtue in all that we do. Confucius, the eternal sage, will forever be remembered as a beacon of wisdom, a teacher for all of humanity.